welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Well, are you guys ready for the word of the Lord tonight? God is so good to us. I believe I have a message from the heartbeat of God. I've been meditating on it for a number of weeks now. And uh, that's kind of the neat thing about having a teaching team is, is when they preach, you, you kind of see things from the word and you just jot a little note down and that note becomes uh, uh, just a, a movement in the heart that now all of a sudden God can bring forth into something great. And I believe that God has something great for us tonight. Uh, if you would, just stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees. Let's go before the Lord. Invite the Holy Spirit to come and teach us tonight. Father, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're grateful to be in your presence, grateful to be in your house, God. Grateful, Lord, that you are God over all. And Lord, tonight as we open up your word, we pray that you open it up to us. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, hearts that understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, give us the vision, the wisdom, the direction, the motivation, even the correction and instruction we need for our lives. God, discipline us, Lord. We invite it. We welcome it. We love it, Lord. When it comes from you, God, because we know that your ways are true and right, God. Tonight, Lord, we don't ask this blessing only on ourselves. We ask it for all the churches that are preaching and teaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, God. They're brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. At no time do we think of ourselves any better than anybody else. But we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom, Father God. Lord, many are having their Wednesday night midweek service tonight. God, bless them. May your spirit be amongst them as it is amongst us tonight. Jesus, mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, amen. amen. You can have a seat, get your Bible. Go with me to the book of Acts tonight. We're going to be in Acts chapter number 19, launching out. And tonight I want to talk to you about a subject called fake or faith. Now we started this night, praise and worship, and at the end of praise and worship, we were having a good shout and a, and a, and a good cry before the Lord and just lifting up the praises of Jesus. And I, and I asked Elijah to start playing some notes and do some different things there on purpose. The reason why I asked him that is because, you know, we need to get outside of ourselves. We need to move ourselves beyond where we're at. And sometimes it just takes a little bit of encouragement. Now, the hard part is, is that the devil comes along sometimes and starts to play little mind games and say, well, that wasn't real. That was fake. You made that happen. Other times we'll be in faith for something, believing God for something, and, and we have a disappointment, and we say, you know, maybe I wasn't really in faith, but maybe it was fake. The Word of God is very clear, and we don't have to wonder what's going on. God gives us the answers in His Word about what is fake and what is faith. Acts chapter number 19, kind of a funny story. Acts chapter number 19, verse number 13 through verse number 16. Verse number 13 starts out, says, some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists now, that right there is just a mouthful, but, I mean, you think about it. These are guys that are going out casting out demons, okay? And they're traveling from place to place. They're itinerant, okay? So they're, they're Jewish. That's their, that's their background, okay? So they're not Christians. They're not a part of the way. They're not identified with the church. These are Jewish itinerant exorcists traveling around casting devils out, okay? What did they do? They took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exercise you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. In other words, somebody had some success with the name of Jesus. Somebody came along and they saw somebody that was probably demon-possessed, and they said, In the name of Jesus, come out of him. Boom, the spirit comes out. Now, these guys saw that, and they said, Wow, that works. So rather than believe on the Lord Jesus, what did they do? They start traveling, and maybe they had some success. Maybe they started to say this, and demons came out. Why? Because the name of Jesus is powerful. Come on. It's the name above every name. And so they believed something, and they started to speak it, and they received it. However, look what happens. Verse number 14, also there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. So in the same way these itinerant Jewish exorcists were traveling around saying, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches, right? They heard about Paul. They heard about what he was doing. They heard about the name of Jesus and how he had success. So they now are having success. Now these seven sons of Siva, a high priest, come along and they do the same thing. Now here comes the last part of this. Look at this, verse number 15. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know. And Paul I know, but who are you? 
Now, you can see why we think this story is humorous, because here the, the, the devil is the one speaking the most truth for some reason. I don't know why that happens, but he's saying, okay, I know Jesus, I know Paul, but, but I'm sorry, who are you? Now, if that weren't enough, the next verse even gets even more wild. Check it out. Verse 16, then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Oh, my. That is quite a predicament. They just got a butt whipping and ran naked and wounded. Now, I highlighted a couple words up on the overhead for our, our own benefit. Look at the demon overpowered them. The demon prevailed against them. They fled, and they were naked and wounded. In other words, they were exposed as fakes, and they were hurt on the way out. See, for us, when we're believing God for something, it can't be the Jesus whom Pastor Dan or Pastor Jim, you know, that, that can't be the way that we approach life. It has to be, this is my gospel, this is my Jesus, he's my God, this is, this is my word, the Lord delivered this to me, that which I received, now I deliver to you. See, there are some, some things about the word of God that we can't have someone else's relationship with God, and so we do what the world says to do, which is a term that I absolutely hate. You guys ever heard this before? Fake it till you make it. You heard that? Now that may work in exercise, that may work in, you know, endurance and doing something until you're able to do it. I get that, I understand that, but can I tell you something? I hate that. Because it gives us the impression that with God, if we fake it with God long enough, that it's gonna make it happen. You say, but pastor, I, I heard about our confession. I heard that we're supposed to be speaking the word of God contrary to the circumstances. Yes, out of a real heart of faith, but not out of a fake, unbelieving, doubting heart. God wants us invested in his word. And when we speak the word of God, even though we may not see it, even though we may not understand it, even though we may not know how it's going to come about, you still have to believe in your hearts. And we'll go through some of these things tonight as we take a look at the Word of God and, and, and clear this up, and, and I believe as we go through this, it's going to be abundantly clear. See, because fake will be exposed. Just like these seven sons of Siva were exposed, if you get my drift, pun intended. Hello, come on, drift. It's okay. But God's never called us to be fake. Where in the Word of God do we get permission that we can fake it till we make it? I don't see God saying, you know what, you're busted. You broke down, you don't got nothing, just fake it till you make it. You know, just act like it's all okay, put on a smile, put on a happy face, you know. No, God never takes a look at a situation and says, oh, that's not it. No, he addresses what it is. God calls a spade a spade, sin is sin, dead is dead, hello. But then what does God do? God speaks faith, God shows us what it is that we are to believe for, and therefore we can receive that promise, and now we can bring it in with a true heart and full assurance of faith. But listen, if you just do a simple word search in the Bible on the words false, lying, hypocrite, those types of words, you will find out what God thinks about fake. Come on, somebody. Because I, I, I did a little word search, and I did not like the verses that I read. I thought, oh my gosh, Lord, please don't ever let me be that man. Because the Lord just is not pleased. And it's abundantly clear about what God feels about that. One verse, one verse for you, just to, just to show you how God feels about this. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 22. I'll put it up on the overhead. It's Proverbs chapter 12, verse 22. Look at this. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Oh, my. God just lumped that in with a whole lot of other abominations that you find in the Bible, things that we will not even utter because they're shameful. God says those are abominations, and you know what else? Lying lips. When you're fake... Your lying lips are an abomination. But look at the rest of the verse. This is encouraging to us. But those who deal truthfully are his delight. In other words, you have every right to get real and get God into your situation and to speak faith, not fake, but to speak faith, and now you're pleasing to God. Are you listening? See, that's good news because that means that we don't have to hide ourselves from situations and we don't have to... see. You know, many times I've heard, you know, people that are coughing and they're snotting, you know. You ever been around people like that? 
and, and they're just hacking, and you're wondering, do they have any lungs left? They must have dropped them at the door or something like that. And, and you're going, gosh, man, somebody get them a lozenge. And, and you're just, you just don't want to be around them. And you say, how you doing? You know, and they're, oh, bless God, I'm, you know, I'm feeling great. I'm, I'm well. And you're going, no, you're not. <laughs> but see, why can't we say, you know what, this body is going to get in line with the word of God, which says, by his stripes I was healed. See, our confession is very important, so you don't fake it. No, you get in faith. And, and that doesn't mean you ignore the circumstances. You say, I may be coughing, but it's not going to be for long. I may be snotting, but it's not going to be for long. Why? Because by his stripes I was healed. See, and there's the difference between faith and faith. A couple of things tonight I want to take a look at. I'm going to run through some of them because we've covered them. Most of us in this room could preach some of these things ourselves and say, you know what, I understand that, but it's good for us to review. It's also good for us to be taught these things if you've never been taught these things. The difference between faith and fake, and I believe as we go through these things, it's going to just keep getting clearer and clearer, the, the, you know, kind of like looking through a window that's dirty, you know, as, as you wipe, every time you go make a pass, it just, the image gets clearer and clearer. I believe that's how it's going to be tonight. Difference between faith and fake. First one is this. Faith is true and real. Fake is false and empty. Simple stuff. Okay? Faith is true and real. Fake is false and empty. Now, we have to define faith, and we can't define it ourselves. We've got to define it by the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1 gives us the definition. If you want to turn there, it's a great verse to know where it is in your Bible. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1 says this. It says, now faith is. Everybody say is. is. This is our definition for faith. This is where we get from the Word of God what we are to understand about faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Everybody say substance. substance. The evidence of things not seen. Everybody say evidence. Two things we find out from the Word of God that faith is. Faith is substance and faith is evidence. In other words, we would define matter, right, as substance and evidence. We would say that is something that is what? Real. But an idea has no substance. An idea has no, no evidence, right? Other, it's, it's on the inside. So when we approach faith, we say, but wait a second, I can't see faith. It, it doesn't have any mass. It doesn't have any weight. It doesn't have any volume. It doesn't have any of that stuff. So how can it be this? It can be this because God defines it as such. My faith is evidence and my faith is substance before God. The Bible tells us that God is the righteous judge. Think for a second. If you're thinking of substance and evidence, think in terms of a court of law. We were to go to San Bernardino Superior Court and there was a case going on. They would have witnesses. They would have the story. The two opposing sides would tell their version of the story. And then what they would do to, to bring in a conclusion to the matter is that they would have evidence, right? We know that so-and-so did it with the candlestick and, and uh, you know, Colonel Mustard was over there and, and he had the rope in the, in the, in the room, you know. And, and so what would they do? They would bring in the evidence. We, we've got fingerprints on the candlestick, that sort of a thing. And, 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 the, and so what they, they would do is they would present the evidence. There would be substance that would be brought forth. That means that in the high courts of heaven, if I'm believing God for something and I have faith and I'm going to bring that thing into my life, now, what is the evidence, what is the substance, is what? My faith. So if I have real faith going before God, then my faith stands in the high courts of heaven, the, the highest law ever, that it is real and not fake. Now, what is fake? Let's define fake. Faith is, fake is not genuine. It's a counterfeit. It's a forgery or a sham. Hmm. In other words, it will not be able to be brought in as evidence before the righteous judge. If you say you're believing God for something, but it's fake, you're not really believing for it, you don't really want it, you're just thinking that's the Christian thing to do or the right thing to do, but there's no faith. When it goes before God, there's no substance, and that case is going to get kicked out of the courts. Are you listening today? See, simple stuff, but when you take a look at it, my goodness, this is powerful. Number two, number two, faith is active Fake is inactive. Now, how many of you can quote this with me? James chapter 2, verse 17. That's also faith by itself. If it does not have works, is dead. Faith without works is dead. So that shows us that faith is active. 
Faith is getting out there and doing something. Sometimes we feel like, you know, well, I've heard about the rest of faith. Yes, there is a rest. When you're in faith, you are believing God and you leave it in his hands and you say, God, I'm trusting you to make this happen. God, I can't do this on my own. Therefore, God, I'm resting in faith. But does that mean that you don't do anything? Does that mean you sit back and, you know, hopefully fairy dust will come and fall and, you know, it'll manifest in your living room or something like that? No, you got to get out there, and what you're believing God for, you got to bring it up in prayer. you got to find a verse. you got to talk to somebody about it. you got to get out there. Sometimes people say, I'm believing God for a job. How many applications have you put in? Well, none. God's going to give me a job. Really? Because if you don't do the accompanying works, you're not going to get anything. But we're believing God. Come on, somebody. Can you say Amen. James 2.17, the J.B. Phillips New Testament says, Yet that is exactly what a bare faith without corresponding life is like. Useless and dead. How about uh, the Message Bible? I like this one. You guys like the Message Paraphrase? This is kind of fun. Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? I just like the way that rolls off my tongue. So the next time you're believing God for something... And somebody calls you on the carpet and says, what have you done with that yet? Well, I'm believing God to be an author. Where's your book? Well, no publisher has approached me. Do you have a manuscript? And you kind of sit there. All you got to do is check yourself. This is how you do it. Just look at yourself and say, self, outrageous nonsense. <laughs> I believe I'm going to be an artist. Where's your art supplies? Where's your canvas? Where's your paper? Well, I don't have any of that. Outrageous nonsense. I'm going to be a great dad. How much time have you spent with your kids? Outrageous nonsense. You see, see, faith without works, you've got to do something with it. You've got to get after it. You've got to get in there and do what you can do until you can't do, and then God will do what only he can do. Are you listening today? Hello. Number three, faith pleases God. Fake displeases God. We kind of covered this in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 22, but you still got your finger there in Hebrews 11? How about this? Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6. Very familiar verse. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6. This is the hall of faith, talking about people who are in faith, doing something, believing God, going after it, right? Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 6, it says, But without faith, it is impossible. Everybody say impossible. impossible. It is impossible to please Him. Capital H, speaking of God, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must, what's that word? Believe. Okay, let's say it louder. What's that word? Believe. believe. You must believe. You must get in faith and believe God for something. If you're going to come to God, you must believe that he is, number one, he is what? He's God. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. There's that accompanying actions. God says, you've got to get after me. Don't, don't, don't give me any rest. Come on, bring it up in prayer. Be that widow with the unjust judge, only our God is just. And will he not give good gifts to his children who ask of him? My goodness, guys. You don't have to bend God's arm back behind. He wants to bless you. He wants to get you in position. He wants to shower you. He wants you to get in faith. He's urging you. He's pleading with you. And so he's saying, faith pleases me. It, it pleases me when you come to me in prayer. It pleases me when you ask me for things. It pleases me when you fellowship with me. It pleases me when I see you getting out there working this thing out. I'm pleased. But if you're going to be fake, I'm not happy. Let's take a look at it in the Word. Romans chapter 14. Verse number 23, Romans chapter 14, verse number 23, talking about food, okay? The Apostle Paul is talking about food. He's talking about if somebody is going to eat meat or somebody's not going to eat meat, if somebody's conscience won't let them or if somebody else's conscience does let them, he, he settles the dispute. Romans chapter 14, verse number 23, it says, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. Now look at the rest of the verse. He stops talking about food and he turns a page and he makes a amazing, powerful statement that we can apply to every area of our life. Look at this. For whatever is not from faith is sin. Let me ask you something. Is God pleased with sin? That was a weak response. We should know better. Is God pleased with sin? No. 
No. That's why Jesus destroyed the works of the devil and went to the cross, was because God hates sin and wanted to deal with the sin issue in our life. So in our lives, if you want to be pleasing to God, that means that you need to be a person of what? Faith. Why? Because whatever is not of faith is sin. Sin is displeasing to God, therefore, I'm going to get in faith. I'm not going to be fake about it. I'm not going to wink at sin. I'm not going to, you know, play with sin. I'm not going to be a little pet in my backyard that I chain up. Listen, it will take you longer than you want to stay, further than you want to go, and cost you more than you want to pay. Are you listening tonight? And therefore, we have to be a people of faith. You want to overcome? You got to have faith. You want to get outside of the bondage? You got to have faith. You want to break free? You got to have faith. You want to win in life? You got to have faith. You want to be victorious? You got to have faith. God is pleased with a life of faith. Number four, faith receives the promise. Faith receives nothing. We can see this in the Word. Turn past the book of Hebrews to the book of James. We'll take a look at two verses talking about this. Faith receives the promise. Faith receives nothing. James chapter 1. Right after the book of Hebrews, you find James. Chapter 1. Beginning of the chapter, James starts talking. says, if you don't have wisdom, ask God. Plain and simple. Believe God for it. Ask Him. Well, look at what he says in James chapter 1, starting in verse... Number six, James chapter one, verse number six, we're going to read through verse number eight. James chapter one, verse six says this, but let him ask in faith with no doubting for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Now, I don't know how much experience you guys have on the water, but have you ever been out on the water for a long time and then you go home and you lay down in your bed at night and you're still in the water somehow? Okay. That's what God views people who doubt. I, w- I want to be in with God, but, but, but you know, I, d- I just don't see how it's going to happen. But, you know, I really want to be in faith. But, uh, you know what, I, r- I really don't understand what God's doing. But, you know, I, I want, and, and what are we doing? We're wavering between two opinions. He says they're like a wave driven and tossed by the wind. Verse 7, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Everybody say receive. receive. See, we all want to receive. And the way that we receive is through faith. But if we don't have faith, we cannot receive. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So how do we do this? Ah, glad you asked. Matthew chapter 11. Turn there with me, please. You need to know this location in your Bible. Matthew chapter number 11. I apologize, not Matthew 11, Mark 11. Mark chapter 11. Hopefully the guys in the back caught that. That's why you bring your Bible to church, just in case the preacher doesn't know what he's talking about. Mark chapter 11. Praise the Lord. Mark chapter number 11, Jesus starts to talk about his miracle that took place. He spoke to a tree and it shriveled up. The disciples say, hey, master, look. He says, yeah, have faith in God. Now, verse 23, for assuredly I say to you, Mark chapter 11, verse 23, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast in the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. See, that's where a lot of times we get confused and we say, well, you know, I'm going to fake it till I make it. I'll just say it until it happens. Just saying it without faith is empty. Because if you doubt in your heart, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Even if you ask God, even if you spoke the word without faith... Not going to get you anywhere. But if you believe the word of God which was spoken, then you are now in position to receive because he says, whatever you say, it will be done for you. Verse 24, therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. 
The problem with this all is, can I just share this with you? Because I'm guilty of it. Is that okay? Can I be honest? The problem is, when we, and I'm putting myself in there with y'all, all right? When we pray, we go, God, I asked you for this. And we close our eyes, and we open them, and it's not there. And we say, God, I don't understand. I don't know why my prayers aren't being heard. But notice what the verse says. When you pray, believe that you receive them, and you will have them. Did he say when? No. So there's a promise from God. I pray and I ask God, and I want that promise, and I believe that I receive it. At that moment, I have it. But it hasn't manifested in my life. You say, how do you have it? I have it by faith. I see it by faith. I've got a hold of it by faith. Now I'm just waiting for the time here on earth that God's going to say, okay, here it is. I already have it. It's mine. Can I give this to you an example? Abraham, right? In the book of Romans chapter 4, it says that he believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness, right? What did he believe? He believed that God was going to give him a son. God said, so shall your descendants be. Look up in the stars. You're going to see all these descendants, all the stars of the sky. If you can count them, that's how many of your descendants are going to be, Abraham. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted him for righteousness. Now, we read that, and we say, we say, wait a second. The book of Romans said he was not wavering in faith, you know, but, but I see him laughing, and I see Sarah laughing. And what happened? Wasn't that fake? Wasn't that off? No, 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 no. Because if you go back to the book of Genesis, you will find that that's not talking about the year before Isaac was born. That was talking about 25 years before Isaac was born in Genesis chapter 15, where Abraham was talking to God at 75 years old. In other words, it, Abraham had a son and had descendants 25 years before the promise was ever delivered into his hands. Are you listening? He believed God. He received it at that moment. 25 years later, he now has the promise in hand. Was there a battle to fight? Yes. Did he try and make it happen in his own strength? Yes. Did he go through some times of laughter where he, you know? Yes. See, we don't deny any of that. Why? Because the moment you realize, wait a second, what am I doing? You get back in faith. And you say, God, forgive me. That was sin. I'm going to believe you, God. I'm going to go after this, God. And now, God, I know that I have it, Lord, so I thank you for it. See, that's why if somebody says, you know, you, you're praying with somebody and they say, oh, Lord, I just thank you that I'm prosperous, I'm successful. And then they go out and you say, wait a second, their life doesn't look like that. What are they doing? They, they're in faith. They know that they have it already. Now they're just thanking God for it and waiting until it manifests in their life. Like this one, number five. Number five. Faith will open the valve of power to us. Faith will keep the power from us. I like this one. Faith will open the valve of power to us. Faith will keep the power from us. Mark chapter 9. You're there in Mark chapter 11. Turn a couple pages back to Mark chapter number 9. Mark chapter number 9, the disciples trying to heal a sick kid. He's demon-possessed. They're trying to cast it out. Nothing's happening. And Jesus is coming down off the mountain. Big commotion, arguments, disputes breaking out. He settles everything down, says, what's going on? Dad comes up and says, you know, came to your disciples ask them to do something. They can't do anything. If you can, you know, Jesus says, if I can, like, excuse me? <laughs> Look at what he says. Mark chapter 9, verse number 23. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Now, I want you to notice something. Look up on the overhead. See those highlighted words, all things are possible to him who believes? Does all things mean just the possible stuff? Does, does all things mean just the stuff that uh, has happened to you in the past? No. All things 
are possible to him who believes. See, when you believe, now you have opened up the valve of power into your life. All things are now possible to him who believes. Again, the problem. What do we see? We see in our lives, and I've had this on my life too. You know, it's got to be like it is in the world, you know. It's got to be like the corporate ladder. What does that mean, Pastor? Well, you know, we think that faith is like the world where you start small and you start low and you get a little, you know, maybe you got healed of a cough first, you know. And then after the cough, then you can believe for the broken bone. After you believe for the broken bone, well, you know, maybe you could believe for somebody, you know, who has rheumatoid arthritis or something bad, you know, that, that they're in their old age they could really get healed. And then, you know, maybe after that, uh, you know, you could see a creative miracle, somebody that, that you know, had polio as a child that their foot grew and then and then when you reach the top of the ladder that's raising people from the dead that's how faith works right no that's not how faith works i'm sorry if you can believe all things are possible to him who believes now does it encourage your faith when you have a little faith battle down here yes thank god god gives us small victories to hold on to but can I submit something to you tonight? You don't have to not believe God to raise somebody from the dead because you've only been healed of a cold and never been healed of the broken bone. You can skip the ladder completely. How do I know that? Because the first miracle that ever happens to any believer is the miracle of salvation, and that is the greatest miracle that we can see on the planet. So when you are introduced to faith, you are introduced to the greatest miracle that you can ever experience. Therefore, what is God saying to us? God is saying that at the beginning of your Christian walk, he's going to take care of the greatest need so that the rest of it looks like the little stuff. If God can save me from hell. God can take care of my bills. If God can take care of my soul, then God can take care of the devil. Come on, somebody. You guys got to get a hold of this. Because otherwise, you're not going to believe God for the great miracles. Oh, I'm believing God for finances. You know, and I, I got to start small. Yes, that's great. Start small. Start somewhere. Start sowing. I understand that. Do not despise humble beginnings. But why not believe God for the greater miracles? Why not believe God for greater things? Why not believe God to just prosper you and bless you? If he can take Joseph from the pit to the palace, what can he do in your life? Amen. Believe in God for too little. God is a big God and God is saying, ask, believe, get up, church. Wake up, realize that you're dealing with things that you don't have to deal with. God is greater. God is bigger. You don't have to put up with small living and small thinking. The devil's going to tell you you have to because you've got to climb that ladder. No, you don't have to. Otherwise, he'll keep you down there. I'm going to believe God for the greatest, the best, the biggest. Why? Because God is the greatest, the biggest, and the best. And guess what? I'm not going to feel guilty about it either. Oh, you're a Christian and you're a pastor. You, you shouldn't have nice things. Show me that in the word, would you? My goodness. The apostle Paul was so wealthy that he wasn't even a burden to the church. Received support from wealthy individuals. People who were in king's palaces supported his ministry. And he worked with his hands to supply his own needs. Let me tell you something. This church is no different. No different. We're working hard. Believe in God for great things, but not so that we can be great, but so that we can show you that, listen, if God can do it with a kid who, who shouldn't be where he's at right now, doing what he shouldn't be doing according to the world, why? Because he didn't walk the ladder. You know, I don't have a doctorate degree. I don't have any of that kind of stuff. I have an associate's degree in music. Can I, can I ask you? D does, that, does that help me preaching? Maybe, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I, I just got it because I like music at the time. I didn't know what else to do. But I just followed Jesus and believed God, and now look what God is doing. See, why do I say that? Listen, I'm not saying that to get applause from me. I'm getting, saying that because 
Some of you guys have stopped believing God. You said, well, I don't have the education. I'm not smart. I'm not cool. I, I, you know, I'm not pretty or handsome. You know, I, I'm, I'm just defeated. And you said, well, I can't do anything because, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not that. You know, there's another saying in the world that I don't like. Can I share it with you? Right? You've got to have money to make money. Now, again, I understand that concept. But can I tell you something? I can go make money standing on the corner with my hand out like this. I didn't have any money, but I made money, right? So that's like saying, well, you got to have faith to have faith, right? You got to have faith to make faith. No, you got to have a promise from God and a listening ear. Did you catch that? You got to have a promise from God and a listening ear. And when you get that and you get that for real, now all of a sudden you open the valve of power. Ephesians 1.19, great verse. Great verse. Ephesians chapter number 1, verse number 19. Middle of a prayer. The apostles praying for the Ephesian church. Right in the middle of the prayer, there's a powerful thought for us tonight about faith, real faith. Faith will open the valve of power to us. Faith will keep the power from us. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who do what? Believe. Believe. In other words, if you think of a pipe, okay, think of plumbing, right? You think of a pipe going to a valve. That pipe is directed at that valve. The water is the word of God, the promises of God flowing through that pipe. But it gets stopped at the valve, okay? The power of God, the working of his power toward us, it's pointed at us who believe. So when we believe, we open up that valve and now the water can flow into our lives. But without faith, the valve never opens. Are you listening tonight? Last one. You guys got time for one more? All right. Last one for tonight. Number six. Faith is a shield to our stance. Faith is an opening for attack. Now, I think we already covered the opening to attack when we talked about the seven sons of Siva running naked in front of a demon, right? Why? Because they were fake and they opened themselves up and were vulnerable and got wounded and fled naked. They were exposed. Same way in our life, if you think you're going to get out there in front of a devil who hates your guts and take a stand without faith, you're going to get knocked out. You're going to get knocked down. You're going to get beaten from pillar to post and you're going to wonder what happened. Here's what happened. No faith. It was fake. It was bravado. But faith is a shield to our stance. In other words, when you're believing God for something, and when you've got the word of God, the Bible tells us in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verse number 16, turn there with me, you're there in Ephesians 1, Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verse number 16. Talking about the the whole armor of God, put it on, you're going to be able to take your stand on the evil day. And look at what he says in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verse number 16. Above all, everybody say above all. Taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. In other words, when you have a promise from God, you put that on your arm as a shield. And you take your stand and you raise that shield up. In other words, you're going to have to take hold of that promise of God and you lift it up and now that promise of God that you are believing God for your faith becomes a shield that you hold up and now when the devil says no you're not going to have it and he shoots that fiery dart into your thinking if you've got faith and it's real and you're standing it's just going to hit that faith shield and it's going to be extinguished it's not going to have any impact on your life See, that's what God is telling us, is I want you to get in faith, church. Not to get fake. Not to fake it till you make it. But to recognize and realize the situation. If you're sick in your physical body, listen, you don't have to act like it's not there. It's okay to say, I'm in pain, but I'm believing God. I'm wounded, but God will heal me. I'm having a hard time, but God's healing me emotionally. I'm in lack. But God is working out all things together. God's going to come through. God's going to supply. God's going to take care. See, it's okay, church, to acknowledge where we're at and even to let other people in because the Bible says that we should bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, the law of love. 
And therefore, when you get other people to stand with you and you stand together in faith, how much greater is that strength? My goodness, when we stand shoulder to shoulder, shields up, swords out, in the face of the enemy that's attacking, my goodness, you'll be able to raise that shield and say, no, I'm believing God. I know that I've got a promise. I've got a hold of it. I'm not letting go of it. The devil, shoot whatever you want to at me. It's not coming through. It's not passing, and it's not going to have any effect. I've got the promise of God that I'm believing him for. Amen? So tonight, fake or faith? Now, hard part for some of us is we say, man, I, that was a great message for someone else. I knew it. I knew that they weren't really in faith. That's why they didn't get healed. But God is saying, where are you at? What are you believing me for? Are you standing? Are you believing? Are you in faith? Or are you fake? Don't think about that other person. God will take care of that other person. God will speak to them, especially if they're in the seat next to you. They just heard it. Don't move. Don't let them know. <laughs> How many of you believe in God for something? Let's stand in the presence of God. If you believe in God for something, stand up. Let's believe God together. Lift your hands to the Lord and signify whatever it is you believe in God for. Right there, just get it up in front of the Lord. You're holding it up before God. Let's say these words. Say, God... I believe, I believe in you for this, for this. That, which I hold. that which I hold. I believe, I believe. And, I and I receive it in Jesus' name. In Jesus name. And, I and I thank you that the power, that the power is not only pointed towards me, towards me but, the but the valve is open and I receive it. And I receive it. God, God, I'm getting busy with it. Busy with it. Lord, Lord, if I've been in sin, I've been in sin. I repent. I turn back to you, back to you. In, faith. in faith, and I'm going to go forward until I can't do any more. And I believe you, God, will do what only you can do, in Jesus' name. And devil, my shield's up. You have no power. I give you no place. I delete the lie, and I believe... The report of the Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God is good. Hey, you guys have been great tonight. I want to thank you guys for staying. Thank you guys for your involvement in the Word of the Lord. I really believe you got something from the Word of the Lord tonight. And I want to not stop there. I want to talk to you about where you're at with God before you leave this place. It would be a tragedy if we had such a great time in the Word and in praise and worship, singing and laughing before the Lord. It'd be a tragedy if we came into the house of God like we did tonight. And I let you go and your heart wasn't right with God. And you died and you didn't go to heaven, but you ended up in hell. Now, a lot of times people hear that and they say, well, Pastor, I don't believe in hell. Now, that's convenient, but again, that's a lie that the devil has fed to us. Because... Do you think that just by burying your head in the sand and thinking that something's not real makes it go away? It doesn't work like that. The Bible speaks very clearly about hell in the Old and New Testament. Jesus talked about it. It's a very real place. We're going to all have to face the reality that at the end of our life, that we're going to end up one of two places, either heaven or hell. And the decision God has left up to us. See, God is not pleased when people go to hell. He's not sadistic. He's not some maniacal... A uh, crazy old man in the heavenlies with a two by four waiting to smack us. No, God loves us and God wants to be with us. But God wanted our free will love to him. And so he gives us the option while we're here on the earth. And we get to choose. He gives us a free will choice whether we go to heaven or whether we go to hell. Now, sometimes people say, well, pastor, all roads lead to heaven. You know, you just do your thing. I'll do my thing. You know, the denominations and the different churches, they can do their own thing. And that's great. As long as they stay true to themselves, God sees that and, and he lets them into heaven. But can I ask you a question? Where do you see that in the Word of God? Is that anywhere in the Bible? Because I don't see it. Any more than we could say that all roads lead to the moon here on earth. Listen, you're not going to get to the moon driving around here on the planet. It doesn't work like that. There's one way you've got to get there. In the same way, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? That means it's God's heaven. You've got to get there God's way. You can't get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. 
got to get there God's way. And don't you think God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, Jesus went to the cross, beaten, bloody mess. Don't you think if he went through all that, that he'd tell us how to get to heaven? Well, he does. Now, sometimes people say, well, I, I know that God lets good people into heaven. And, and, you know, God talks about being a good person. And therefore, I've been good. You know, I've done more good than bad. Used to be bad. Clean up my act. Now I'm good. And, and therefore, you know, I've helped out people, gave money to charities and been nice to my neighbors. Now, I believe God's going to let me into heaven because I've been good. The problem with that statement is that nowhere in the Bible says you can be good enough to get into heaven. In fact, if you read your Bible, you would know that our goodness compared to God's goodness is like filthy rags. They're going to get thrown out, not going to get to stay. And the only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. And so we're not going to make it to heaven just by being good because the Bible records that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're not going to make it on our own merit. Can't be good enough to get yourself into heaven. Sometimes people say, well, I understand that, but I was raised in church. Parents told me we're Christians. Born in a Christian nation, everybody born in America is a Christian. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus. I went to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. They hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child? And you're saying, I'm going to get to heaven because I was raised in church. You know that nowhere in the Bible? Check it out. Nowhere. Nowhere does it say you're raised in church. Parents tell you you're Christian. That makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible say that because you're not some other religion, that because you're born in America, that God lumps you in the category of being a Christian headed for heaven. Nowhere in the Bible say you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry, or be baptized or christened as a child, and that gets you to heaven. You say, okay, pastor, I understand that, but you know, I'm sitting in church tonight right in front of you right now. Here I am. I am in church right now, not just when I was a child. Now, church right now. Doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? I consider myself to be a Christian. I came to church. That's great. I'm glad you're here tonight. Show that to me in the Bible. Where you attend church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It's like saying I can go to my garage, sit in my garage, call myself a car, and that makes me a car. It doesn't work like that. You can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, and that makes you a Christian. Sometimes people say, ah, I understand that, Pastor, but my last church, I got involved. I helped out, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. I even taught in the Bible class, got a membership card. That's great. I'm glad you did those things. But could you just show that to me in the Bible where you help out, make decisions, sing in the choir? People think of you as a leader, carry the pastor's Bible, that you get to go to heaven. Can you show me in the Bible where you teach in the Bible classes or because you got a membership card that God's looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven? It's not there. Nowhere. Nowhere does God say church involvement gets you into heaven. And yet a lot of people, American churches, think that they're going to get to go to heaven because they got involved. You say, but hold on a second, because I know God, and, and, and I believe that makes me a Christian. You know, I celebrate Easter and the resurrection, sing the songs at Christmas every year of my life. I could quote scriptures to you, Pastor, Old and New Testament. Now, while that's great, I'm glad you can do those things. Have you read your Bible? Because if you'd read your Bible, you know the demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about having mental assent towards God, knowing who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God. If that were the case, everybody would be headed for heaven because everybody knows who Jesus is. You ask somebody on the street, you know Jesus? Oh, yeah, I know Jesus. We all know who Jesus is, but God's not after your head knowledge. He's after your heart. Jesus said, you must be born again if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I know our society's given us a lot of wacky, goofy terminology about being born again. They've made it out to be l lunatic, you know, just weirdo stuff. This is not about what our society says or movies or Hollywood or television or books or internet. It's about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean? Because Jesus said you're not going to get to heaven without being born again. Very important for us to know what it means. Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. That's simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. In Revelation, last book in the Bible, Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot. Or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are graphic, gross words for the mouth of Jesus. But what's he talking about? Lukewarm? What's that? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down. A little token prayer every now and again. Occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm gonna to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm gonna to count to three just like this. One, two, three, and when I say three, I'm gonna pop my hands together, bang. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. 
What you're doing by the raising of your hand is saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second, wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah, you might be. Let's push past that embarrassment tonight. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. And yet the devil is firing those flaming arrows that you're thinking right now, saying, this is fake. It's not real. The feelings that you're feeling, the, the, the draw that you're feeling to, to do this, it's not real. Come on, let's believe God tonight. Say, yeah, I know I need to do this. I need to give God all my heart. I need to give God all my life. Raise up that shield tonight. And let's give God all of our heart. Give God all of our life. Who should raise their hand? Sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should do this. Who should raise their hand? If you never said yes to Jesus, giving him all of your heart and life, come on, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand? If you're not sure about your salvation tonight, come on, please make sure. Finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Maybe you've been running from God instead of to God. Come on, tonight, I'm speaking to you. All across this auditorium, wherever you're at, back in the family rooms, or if you're watching by television in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe, or online all over the world, get ready to get your hands up. If you're online, click the blue button or the Respond to God button on our homepage. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. For those of us that are in here, I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. You can raise your hand. God is watching. And for those of you that are in the foyer of the Love Rock Cafe, telling us or coming to the church service right afterwards. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. God bless you. Who else tonight? Five wise people already. You know you need to give six. Thank you up top. Got gotcha. you. Six wise people. Come on. Where are you at? Where are you at, number seven? Sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should. Go for it. Anybody else that I didn't already see your hand? We got seven wise people already. Is there a hand over this way? Who else tonight? Seven wise people already. They're still pointing over there, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Is it in the family room? Just wave it at me if I don't see you. You don't, you don't think I've seen you. Anybody real quick? Anybody else? All right. Anybody else on this side? Come on, I'm going to close this up. Gosh, I, I sure hope that you searched your heart right now and said, yeah, I need to do this. I need to do this. Who else tonight? Anybody else? I'm going to close this up. Don't miss this opportunity. You've missed enough opportunities in your life. Come on. Let's give God all your heart and all of your life. Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a hand for about six wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. All six of you. Oh, my. God just spoke to me that there are 13 more that you need to give God all of your heart and you need to give God all of your life. Here's what we're going to do. Elijah's going to lead us in a song. As he does, we're all going to stand. We're all going to give a clap and a cheer. That's, that's our support to you. We're, we're saying, yeah, we're excited for you. No one's judging you, criticizing you, condemning you. But if God just spoke to you when I said 13 and you said, mm, that's me, okay? I want you to get a hold of your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church. Get a hold of a friend if you need a friend. And if you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. All right? So let's all stand and welcome them. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, you come right now. No one leave. Let's let them come right now. You come right now. Come on down. Come on down. I'm going I'm to give a plea. I'm going to ask. There's 10 more of you. 
that need to come. That means we had six. Three came out of the 13. And if you're one of those 10 people out there and you're saying, gosh, I just don't know if I can. You know you need to do it. Remember we talked about faith is active. You have no problem saying you believe, saying you're a Christian. But when it comes to putting legs to your faith, you haven't yet done that. God's telling you the first step is to come right now. You just come right now. Just come out of your seat. If that's you, you're one of those ten. You're saying, I know God's tugging at my heart right now. God's just speaking to you and saying, go ahead. Here's what the Lord's saying. He's saying, don't be afraid. Come on, they're coming. There's two more. Wait, 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 wait. I know you guys are excited. I love you guys. My goodness, you guys are wonderful. I'm so excited. There's two more. Come on, there's, there's more. They're coming. They're coming. God's saying, don't be afraid. Now there's six more that need to come. Come on, God's just tugging at your heart. And Sam, will you come? Don't be afraid. Who else tonight? Come on. Six more of you. Now there's five more. Who else tonight? Now there's four more. There's three more. Come on. Come on, God's speaking to you. There's three more. Come on. I gotta close this up. God is holding everything up just for you. He loves you so much. He loves you. Just come. There's three more of you. Where are you at? Just make your way to the front right now. Come on. Come on, I gotta close this up. But God's waiting for you. God's tugging at your heart right now. You see, I it's me. Come. Come on. It's the last call. And I'm going to close this up. I've got to let everyone go. And so I'm just going to ask you quickly to come. All right. I'm going to give some instructions. And it's still not too late. You can still come while I'm talking, okay? Hey, you guys up front. Thank God you guys have come. So excited for you guys. So excited for what God is doing in your lives. Right over here to my right, your left. This is one of our pastors, Pastor Joel. Good guy, nothing weird's going on, okay? He's going to do three things. He's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart, lead you in a simple prayer. You're going to be born again. Secondly, he's going to give you some free information and free literature that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. And then finally, he's going to give you some information about a program that we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Basically, it's a friend in church. We give away friends here at The Rock. That's just what we do, all right? And... Uh, a spiritual personal trainer is a friend in church who will help you get strong in the ways of the Lord. He'll describe how it works. It's easy. It's free. You need to do it, all right? And then he'll let you come right back out. Your friends and family will wait for you. If you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Joel, let's give him a hand as they go. <laughs> Hallelujah.
Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.